We are live at a press conference here in Chicago, Illinois, where we hear that any minute the nostalgia critic is going to make a public appearance addressing his last video. For those who are unaware, the nostalgia critic posted a let's play of Bart's Nightmare last week, which was considered by many to be so horrendously unfunny that they'd rather shove a needle factory up their scrotums. Ah, and here is the Nostalgia Critic preparing to explain his actions. Um, hello everyone, uh, I'm the Nostalgia Critic. Uh, I remembered so you don't have to. Uh, they allowed me a short amount of time out of the Internet State Penitentiary. So, a little surprised to see that place actually existed, but apparently it's right next to the State Home for the Ugly. So, uh, they allowed me a short time out to answer your questions addressing the video I did last week. Ah, uh, yes. How does it feel to know that you've made the absolute worst Let's Play to ever be put on the internet? Bad. Definitely, uh, bad. Uh, but hopefully I can make some more funny videos and move on from it. Uh, yes. I had a robber break into my house, kill my wife, and eat my children. Uh, he's not as bad as you. Thank you for that. And, uh, I am very sorry for your loss. Don't give me your pity. Uh, yes. <clears throat> Melvin, the brother of the Joker, Emo Jones, this recent Let's Play, Nazi Germany. That is all. Okay, uh, if we could keep the questions to actual questions, uh, that'd be fantastic. Uh, yes. How do you account for this travesty among the world? Look, um, when everything is said and done, at the end of the day, I just made a bad video. <gasps> Your fans deserve better, Mr. McCritic! Sure, you tried something new, it didn't work, it bombed like mad, but now you deserve to give your fans something better! I mean, I liked it, I thought it was the greatest video I ever saw in my life, but you owe your fans something better! Well, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what. Why don't I do a positive review of a movie that a lot of people seem to enjoy? Oh, you mean like Jeans and the Giant Peach? Jeans and the Giant Peach? That hunk of... Cinematic brilliance? Ah yes, how can I not forget the awkwardly written yet structurally confusing masterpiece that is James and the Giant Peach? Not that there's anything wrong with that, it's not like the film did poorly at the box office but got a surprising cult following over the years. Or that the critical reaction at the time was lukewarm at best, but recently is being declared as a timeless classic. <laughs> it's not like my need to please the masses is going to affect my opinion in any conceivable way. I'm just going to praise it for the wonderful family romp that it is. Really. So for those who don't know, the film is based on the book by Willy Wonka author Roald Dahl, and directed by famous stop-motion director Henry Selleck, who also directed The Nightmare Before Christmas. As you can see, his stop-motion has clearly gotten better. Good God, they look like actual fucking people. Look! That cloud looks like a camel. And that one over there looks like a train engine. And that one looks like a crappy CGI effect. I mean, a good CGI effect. And can you see the tallest building in the world? I see it! That's where we're going. The timing of those clouds was perfect. I mean, they formed the Empire State Building just as they tell them they're about to go to the Empire State Building. <laughs> I wish the clouds in my neighborhood were that convenient. <sighs> if only there was a way I could avoid the Chicago traffic. Take the L train, of course, that's a great idea! Oh, but which one goes to the loop? Of course, how stupid of me! Oh, but what if I want to keep my options open? Wow, that's amazingly helpful! Thanks, incredibly convenient passing pile of clouds! So everything seems to be absolutely peachy for James and his angelic parents. But then things suddenly, and I do mean suddenly, go very rotten. Then, one day, a terrible thing happened. An angry rhinoceros appeared out of nowhere and gobbled up his poor mother and father. Angry rhinoceros appeared out of nowhere and gobbled up his poor mother and father. I mean, really? 
Really, what else can you say but... What? That is the most out-of-nowhere explanation of parents disappearing ever! They don't explain it, we never see it happen, just... The rhinoceros comes out of nowhere and eats them! Their troubles, if they had any at all, were over in 35 seconds flat. Yeah, I'm not editing that down either. That's literally how they show it to us. Parents there, gone, blame the right. It's a pretty rushed explanation, isn't it? Can you imagine if one of the Disney movies did that? Look, Simba. Everything the light touches is our kingdom. Wow. And then the rhino ate him up. Hakuna Matata. What a wonderful phrase. Yeah, how do you think that'd go over? Probably better. So, of course, now he has to live with his evil aunts. Yeah, how come the kindest parents in the world always have the most dick-ass relatives? Look at him, lollygagging in dreamland, when there's so much work to do. Weeds to pull, wood to chop. Work, 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 work! Okay, I think this calls for another... SCARY Jesus Christ! I wonder if they use that picture for their email greetings. Happy New Year from the Hag Sisters. May all your resolutions come true, and don't forget to... <laughs> so this is Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker. You know, when you name your kids that, are you just begging for them to turn out like this? They're played by British comedians Joanna Lumley and Miriam Margolis. And in keeping with England tradition, they give the best British confidence build-up they can muster. Get these stupid dreams out of your head and get back to work! He never even saw that rhino coming. That rhino! And the beast will get you too! <laughs> now, in any other movie, I'd say these two were as strongly constructed as a bomb shelter made out of popsicle sticks, but in this movie, it works. Because... I really want you to like me right now. So as James gets back to work, 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 work! He can't help but hum a merry little tune. My name is James. That's what mother called me. Wow, what horrible lyrics. What a bland tune. What totally forgettable melody. This can only be the work of... That's right, Randy Newman wrote these songs. Oh, and just like his other work, it's lame, annoying, repetitive, unoriginal, inspiring, charming, wonderful piece of music that I expect from such a musical genius. I mean, how can you not love such emotionally packed lyrics like, My name is James. That's what mother calls me. My name is James. So it's always been. That's ingenious insight, isn't it? I mean, here I thought James, as in James and the Giant Peach, was referring to somebody else. But nope, this song points out that it's the James right in front of us and not a James in another town or country. And the fact that he explains it's his mother that named him is also very important. Because we could have made the horrible mistake of thinking his father named him. But no, this incredibly crucial lyric points out that it was, in fact, his mother. Oh, I wonder what other incredible insight they're going to give us. Sometimes I forget when I'm lonely or afraid. Then I'll go inside my head and look for James. Well, that obviously explains itself. I don't have to explain it for you. So as James is admiring what a beautiful set-out it is today, he suddenly comes across the late Pete Pothelthwaite, playing what looks like a time-traveling Captain Crunch. Oh, don't be frightened, James. I mean you no harm. How do you know my name? <laughs> I know more than just your name. I know your pants size, too. Just let me have that! Just let me have that! So he gives him a bag of kryptonite pasta that he claims can make all his dreams come true. But what are they exactly? 1,000 long, slimy crocodile tongues boiled in the skull of a dead witch for 20 days and 20 nights. Add the fingers of a young monkey, the gizzard of a pig, the beak of a parrot, and three spoonfuls of sugar. And a cute lunch in a pear tree. The only downside is he trips and lets it fly all over the place. Wait. 
Flubber! Here he is. Eat up, you little worm. The two ants are angry, of course, because that's the one note they've been given. When they come across an amazing discovery. Look, a peach! There, on that branch. Why, that old tree's never had so much as a blossom on it, let alone a... Well, I'll be blowed. I'm good. But the peach apparently has the power to keep on growing until it finally transforms into Garfield's anus. The ant, of course, sees the opportunity to make a buck off of this and start charging money for people to see it. Oh, stop. Photographer. <laughs> It's like someone put clown makeup on the Crypt Keeper. And don't even think of going near our peach. Remember, they never did catch that rhino. So while James is out doing, what else? Work, 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 work! He comes across one last piece of nuclear snot that allows him to climb inside the peach and apparently change his appearance. <laughs> <In trouble! laughs> so it turns out the glowing turtle semen made a bunch of the bugs bigger and able to talk. And it turns out that they all coincidentally want to go to New York. But they have to hurry fast, or else the two evil aunts will come across them. Where are you, boy? I think I hear a rhino out here. Boy, they really like playing that rhino card, don't they? For something that was vaguely explained in a millisecond, they sure do bring it up a lot. Timber. Oh, hey, great! The movie suddenly turned into Marble Madness! So the peach rolls out to the Atlantic Ocean, where it appears all they have to do is ride it all the way to New York City. I'll get us there! You? Sure! I sailed all the five seas! But they have to look out for a giant mechanical shark ship! Oh, don't act like you've never seen one. Floats to the surface and tries to catch them. We do our hunting and farming here. The sea supplies all my wants. But James thinks up a pretty creative idea by roping all the seagulls he can find and using them to fly away. My, 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 so as they start eating part of the peach because they're hungry, all the bugs decide to... I've eaten many strange and scrumptious dishes in my time. <sighs> really? We're singing a song about eating the goddamn peach? These foods are rare beyond comparing some right out of reach. No, man. But there's no doubt I'd go without a million plates of each. I mean... Not that I have a problem with them singing about this at all! I'm sure this does a great deal to further the story and give insight into the characters. I'm just a little curious what other similar musical numbers they turned down to fit this one in. Such important songs like, The sky is blue, My tongue is in my mouth, Butts make poo, and God knows what else. God, can you imagine what this movie would be like without these essential Randy Newman songs? No, but God, I'm trying to! So as the spider starts to tuck James to sleep, or is she planning to eat him? He finds out that she much prefers a life of being alone. I think it's much nicer to have friends, don't you? I would not know. They would be your friends too. The others, I mean, if you just let them. No, it is in their nature to have fear of me. This I cannot change. Well, wait, when in any of the previous scenes did it indicate that they were afraid of her? Or that she kept her distance? Or hell, even that she was quiet? She interacts with them, dances with them. She even thinks them a Randy thong. So where's this sudden loner story arc coming from? Now to sleep. You have had a very tired making day. By the way, if I am sucking your brains out in the middle of the night, I apologize. <sighs> so James goes to sleep and has a dream that he's in Monty Python's Flying Circus. You can't crawl away from us! Now, 
Now, of course that scene was necessary because it needed to show that James is afraid of a giant rhinoceros that killed his parents. See, I'm glad that they had this scene in the movie because I never would have put together that James was afraid of a giant rhinoceros that killed his parents! Heck, I'm surprised Randy Newman didn't write a song about that! Rhinos, they scare little boys. Assassinating parents don't bring them much joy. It's Randy. But it turns out the centipede led them in the wrong direction, and now they're in the Antarctic. So they go underwater to see if they can find a compass to lead them in the right direction. They come across several pirate ships, including one that has the statues of his ants in front of it. I don't get it. When they suddenly come across skeleton pirates, one of them played by Jack Skellington. Was this an incredibly clever cameo? Or was Henry Selleck just too cheap to make other puppets? Either way, it's pretty cool. Listen, fellas, I got a long history of back problems. Now, tell me what you know about Christmas Land. <laughs> but James and the spider come to save him, just making up the law of underwater physics as they go, and manage to get the compass. <laughs> and since I am dead, I can take off my head. Mr. Centipede, would you please do us the honor of navigating us out of this icebox? Seeing how you got us into this icebox. You said it, Mr. Grasshopper. So just as you're wondering if those birds ever need to eat or sleep, we see James come across a rather touching musical moment. nice. That's a very genuine moment. That's an enchanted musical scene that doesn't need to succumb to the typical Randy Newman formula. Take a little time. Just look at where we are. No man! We come very, very far together. Love is the strangest thing. Love. No, don't dance with her. It is in your nature to have fear of her. Love. By the way, if you're wondering what all of those things flying around in the background are, guess what? Never explain. But that's not a bad thing, no! It makes about as much sense as, oh, I don't know, an unexplained giant rhinoceros killing some middle-aged people! But that works! In a way I can't possibly explain at all, it still works, it still works! So just when it looks like they finally made it to their destination, they come across a rather unfriendly visitor. Choose. Choose the form of the destructor. Remember what your parents said, James? Look out, a rhino? Try looking at it another way! So the rhino zaps the birds, allowing the peach to fall. Rhinos, they scare little boys. Actually, it lands on top of the Empire State Building, right dab in the middle of New York. And just what exactly was that giant rhino that James said was only a bunch of smoke and noise? I don't know! I don't know! All that build up and they never explained what he was running from that whole time! And that's just fine! So after James changes back to his normal self, the ants come in and try to take back what they claim is rightfully theirs. But James isn't gonna have any of that. This is all something he dreamed up. Well, maybe it started that way, as a dream, but doesn't everything? Those buildings, these lights, this whole city. Somebody had to dream about it first, and maybe that's what I did. I dreamed about coming here, but then I did it. You're going home with us. No, not this time. I flew in a giant peach across the ocean. I landed on top of the tallest building in the world. I made it. I'm not the one who's nothing. You are. How dare you speak to us this way? Jesus, ladies! Peachy! 
But it turns out the bugs come in to save the day. The city can't believe their eyes. So they pull the two ants up and wrap them up in web. No doubt suffocating them to death. I love how the police officer all this time is like, yeah, I'm gonna allow this. So everybody brings out the confetti they've been holding on to for God knows what reason, and James becomes a hero telling all the kids on the block his tale. James, dinner is ready. All right, nearly finished. And then an exciting unexplained anti-climax with a rhino. And that's James and the Giant Peach. It's fantastic, glorious, stupendous. But if I was to find some fault with it, just hear me out, just hear me out! I would say that while the film is creative, it's also pretty clumsy. A lot of stuff doesn't add up, a lot of scenes go nowhere, the songs are pretty forgettable, and the live action stuff is surprisingly more over the top than the animated stuff. What they changed from the book actually raises more questions than it does simplify things, which results in it being both weird and confusing. But with that said, the animation is very good. Designs are a lot of fun, and even things like those cheesy sets actually do have sort of a strange charm to them. You also have to give the film credit that it didn't need to resort to pop cultural references, as a lot of animated films were doing at that time. It was at least trying to tell a timeless story. So is it for me? No. But I can see why it has an audience. The stuff that's neat is still pretty neat. And there's a lot of things in the movie that can be considered pretty impressive. So I guess I can't really fault people for enjoying something that does give way to a lot of imaginative scenarios. It may be flawed, but I think we all know that you're gonna get a great big dose of something really creative. And that's all I gotta say about that. There. Have I restored anything in your guys' eyes? He says he didn't like the movie! Kill him! So